What's up everybody? This is the 2009 Pontiac Solstice. Huge thanks to Jake and Ken Ganley Toyota for providing me here with this very pristine Pontiac Solstice to review for you guys today. This one has just 4,000 miles on it. It is available at Ken Ganley. I will leave a link in the description where you can contact Jake if you want to uh, check this vehicle out. But as far as the 2009 Solstice, this is the last final model year of the Solstice. They technically made a few 2010s, but uh, this was the last normal year of production here from what was an amazing run of vehicles. They sold over 65,000 of these things in just roughly four years of production, which was really good for a little roadster like this. And combined with the over 32,000 sales you had for the Saturn Sky and the Opel GT, which this shared a platform with, I mean, there was over 100,000 of these things built total. And, um, you know, it was just a time when these things could also thrive and could be a nice low price tag these started at just twenty thousand dollars whenever they were introduced in 2006 uh you know not accounting for inflation but you know it's just an impressive little car for the money and uh, it was a fun fresh new option for people who you know didn't want a miata or you know didn't want an s2000 or something like that you know this was a really cool unique thing and i just love the styling on it they went so bold it looks really close to the concept car that debuted a few years earlier and uh it's just so bold i mean look at that grill i mean that grill you know, could almost be touching the ground there. It's just how low it is and the curvature to the front nose there is so bold. And it's also kind of funny, some of the recycled parts too, like those fog lights down there are from a Pontiac Grand Prix. Uh, the rear lights there are from a GMC Envoy for those little uh, park lights there. Uh, but I mean, you know, the headlights, I love the way they come up over the fenders here a little bit. And you know, the wide clamshell hood is just so, so cool. And even the Pontiac badges are great. It's just so cool to see that badge because it's not something you see very often these days. And then I'm even like, you know, the silver A-pillar, you know, roof surround area here is really cool. Tiny little side mirrors, um, which is interesting for drivability, but looks great on the outside here. And then even like the roll hoops you have right behind the seat backs there is so cool. And those taillights that again did the same kind of thing where they meet up with the uh, rear quarter panels there. And uh, it's just such a cool looking little vehicle. It got even cooler looking with the GXP version, which was the faster turbocharged version. Uh, but even for these regular versions, they look really cool and uh, I mean, the sales numbers speak for themselves. A lot of people are really excited about these. They were lining up out the door when these things first debuted and uh, for good reason. It's just such a cool looking little car. So for the interior in the Solstice, well, it is interesting. It's a combination of parts bin stuff, but it's been put together in a way that, you know, it does make this feel like a dedicated sports car, you know, having this cockpit style curvature to the center console area and, you know, these sporty seats, which are wrapped in leather and actually are really nice and plush to be totally honest here. And again, this one only having 4,000 miles, I'm sure that's certainly helps but uh, they're actually really nice seats and have a good bit of bolstering to them and uh, I really like them and uh, so one funny thing though about these seats you'll see there's a little pocket here and um, I'll just get right to it the storage space in this vehicle is probably the worst amount of storage I've ever had in a vehicle I've reviewed you have this little map pocket uh, you know beneath your legs here which shows you how desperate they were to give you storage spaces there's absolutely nothing in the doors nothing in the center here due to the design of this chassis apparently there was no room for anything here so you basically just have one little pop-out cup holder here on the passenger side that you can barely even see from the driver's seat. And then uh, in the back here, you do have a little uh, cubby space um, that's actually borrowed from the XLR, if you remember those. Um, there used to be two cup holders here on everything except the 2009, you'll get two cup holders there. For some strange reason, they deleted them here uh, for the 2009 model year. So you have one cup holder um, and <laughs> that's pretty much it. So nowhere to really put anything in this vehicle. The trunk space is also uh, laughable, especially with the roof down, you have basic Basically nothing and even with the roof up you know it's pretty small maybe a duffel bag size at best but anyway getting on to the other you know components of this vehicle uh, you have the same steering wheel you get from like a Pontiac G6 but honestly it's a great steering wheel it has a great 9 and 3 grip little 10 and 2 notches but just a nice thin rimmed wheel it has the little indents here on the back of the wheel and just a few buttons here on it uh, but honestly just actually a really nice wheel so that's one of the cases where part sharing isn't bad another case of that is the gauges which are right out of a cobalt pretty much but you know they're following the trend of the time which was these deeply hooded uh, gauge pods but they look great I mean there's not a ton of information there that's the only downside that little digital display on the right there will show you um, your coolant temperature tire pressure a couple of 
basic things like that. But other than that, I mean, you know, just nice and fun looking gauges. Coming over to the center here, you'll see that you have uh, the double din GM head unit that you saw on everything around this time period here. And the great thing about that actually is that since it's a double din unit, you can easily pull that out and put in a touch screen if you want. And it's gonna be, you know, really easy swap and it helps them make this vehicle a little more modernized if, you know, that's something you wanna do and it's easily reversible since you can just pop this one right back in if you want. Uh, but other funny things like these, they have these really chunky climate control knobs, which I mean, I appreciate, especially these days, you know, we don't have cl climate controls in anything pretty much, it's all screen based, but these are actually from a Hummer H3. Of all the GM vehicles to pull from the parts bin, the Hummer H3 is what they chose for the climate controls here, but you know, I mean, it's fine. They get the job done. You know, it is what it is. But uh, other funny things here, you know, are that uh, it was an option for everything. Power windows were still an option. Cruise control was an option. Air conditioning was an option. Power mirrors were an option. I mean, all these basic things, power door locks, that was all optional still here, even in 2009. And uh, I mean, so it's kind of funny, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but I mean, the amount of decontenting you could do with these, honestly, it was actually really cool in this specific case because, you know, you could drop about 80 pounds out of the vehicle if you went for that truly base one coming in right at about 2,800 pounds. Um, and, uh, but, you know, just really funny. I mean, everything else, of course, is typical GM hard plastic from the time period. So, I mean, no surprises there. You know, you don't even have anything nice to rest your elbow on. It's all hard plastic. They could have at least put, like, padding on top of this or something. They didn't bother with that either. But, again, this was built to a price and I can respect that. And so, you know, you do have a little bit of padding here on the door at least, which is nice because that door is pretty nice and close to you. Even me, I'm not a big guy. And uh, you know, I'm a little cramped in here if I'm honest, but, uh, and even, you know, you have a pretty high seating position too. So even I feel like being five foot nine that I'm almost too tall for this vehicle. So you'll definitely want to sit in one of these if you're considering it. But anyway, you know, it's, it's still a fun interior. And this one again is really pristine. It even has the uh, airbag tag there on the passenger side from when it was new. So I mean, really meant and a great look at how these you know hold up to over time i mean everything still is really nice looking here and uh, you know i think for again the type of vehicle this is it's still you know a really fun little interior but let's start up and go for a drive the solstice just of course had a normal twist key the keyless entry here was an option this one does have so anyway you just uh, slip the key into the slot and it starts right out all right, so setting off here in the 2009 Pontiac Solstice. So first things you notice here, uh, I think the first thing that I'm noticing here is that again, like I said, my seating position is kind of high. So even the windshield's pretty narrow and you know, side mirrors are tiny, so not super helpful there. And uh, I haven't driven this vehicle with the roof up, but I can only imagine, you know, the blind spots in the back wouldn't be the best and it wouldn't be super easy to drive, but at least it's a nice small car. Um, so, you know, shouldn't be too bad. But other things you notice here about the Solstice, well, the ride is actually a pretty smooth you know for a little roads like this you know it was set up to be more on the comfortable side and uh, you know I mean you, it's certainly still a sports car you still feel all the bumps and everything but it's not jarring or rough or unrefined really and uh, actually I think they did a good job with the suspension tuning here at least at low speeds um, other things you notice about it well the brakes on this one um, don't feel super grabby or strong that could just be an age thing I'm not sure but uh, you know they work normally uh, one thing that's actually really interesting is this manual transmission it was a five speed manual still for these even though I think the Miata had a six speed at this time period but five speed here in this and it's actually the same transmission they used in the GM trucks at the time including even the Hummer H3 but also the Colorado and the Canyon of the time obviously a different shifter but the transmission itself is the same it's an Eisen transmission and it actually feels really good and uh, it's I'm actually really happy with it especially compared to modern manuals this feels really organic and very well-defined gears and the, you know it's just really easy to use the clutch is also you know fairly light it's pretty reasonable not too heavy or anything and uh, overall it's you know pretty easy car to drive as far as all that stuff goes steering also is uh, you know nicely weighted uh, you know kind of old school with this feeling of course this is before the days of electronic power steering but um, you know it just feels really accurate and feels really good slightly getting on it there a little bit you can also hear there's a nice little burble from the exhaust even though this motor is again basically like the same motor you get in like a Chevy Cobalt or something nothing really special I mean it has variable valve timing on it but uh, you know nothing uh, wildly sporty or anything but they did a nice little tune there on the exhaust uh, and I'm sure of course that's something you can improve with the aftermarket as well if you'd like but um, it actually has a nice little burble here again being a stock exhaust it's uh, pretty good and uh, it just, it's really smooth too. It makes torque 
pretty low in the RPM band. I think, you know, peak torque starts to come on right around like 2,400 RPMs and carries you all the way through, I think, like 4,600 RPM. So pretty meaty mid-range, something that's, you know, a little bit of an improvement over like an S2000, for example. Obviously, S2000 is way faster. That's got a lot more horsepower than this does. But, uh, you know, as far as just torque around town, you know, this is totally fine. You, you don't have to downshift a bunch of times to climb a hill or anything. It's actually pretty decent. And um, also the wind noise here, you know, doing like, you know, 35 miles an hour. It's not bad, you know, there's not bad wind buffeting or anything here. It's uh, actually a really nice, relaxing little thing just to take in the elements uh, in this nice small little roadster. It's just a really nice experience. But let's turn down onto this back road here and see how it does. Here we go. Wow! Nice little sound to it and good amount of punch to be totally honest. It doesn't feel slow, which you might be surprised considering it has a 2.4 liter nationally aspirated four cylinder engine. It does 177 horsepower, 166 pound feet of torque, and zero to 60 time for these was about 7.2 seconds. So, you know, I mean, not bad to be totally honest. Again, for a little vehicle, you know, the whole point of it is be a fun little roadster that you bring out. And again, just only having five gears also means that, you know, the gears are fairly closely spaced and you're actually able to, you know, uh, get a good amount of punch out of every gear here. And, uh, you know, and it actually doesn't get terrible fuel economy on the highway either. I think it's rated like 28 MPG, even though you only have five gears to work with. Um, but yeah, that mid-range punch is actually really nice from like three to four grand. And, and the sound is better than I was expecting, to be totally honest. I'm actually, you know, I came into this review like every review with an open mind, but I was a little skeptical of, you know, some of the components and, you know, the part sharing and the carryover stuff here. But it's actually really nice. I really am enjoying it. And it's easy to rev match your downshifts as well. Um, and you know, it's got a pretty light flywheel, relatively speaking, so that it's just like, I mean, I've only been driving this vehicle for, you know, maybe 45 minutes or so, so far just to get to the filming spot. And I mean, it's been really effortless to learn, you know, the catch point and, you know, doing rev matching is like really brainless, honestly. It's really, really just a nice easy vehicle to drive just it's relaxing it's fun it's enjoyable nice mid-range punch yeah this thing is I think really underappreciated now if you wanted to have the most power possible the GXP version was really the one for the speed demons you know that had 260 horsepower there's even a tune you could do uh, from the dealer that would I think bump up to 290 horsepower that's probably a riot but even these regular ones are a lot of fun uh, especially these days for the money I'll get to the pricing in a second but I mean these things uh, you know it's a lot of car and a lot of little fun for you know very little money these days and now coming up to a back road here Let's see how it handles. I really love this shifter. It's so much, so much better than I was expecting. But so as far as the handling goes, it's nice and you know, darty. And since it's got a pretty short wheelbase here, it's on the Kappa platform. That again, was shared with the Sky, and the Opel GT. Um, you know, this actually handles really nicely. Nice and flat. Like I said, nice and light too. I mean. For the time, they were kind of heavier. They were viewed as being heavy because these were about 300 or so pounds heavier than an NC Miata, which was around around the same time as well. And so, yes, it's, you know, 2,800 pounds without options. But honestly, that is still super light. And in a vehicle like this, you know, it's just carving up these corners, no problem. And it just feels so communicative. It just, you know, the steering, I could use a little more feeling through the steering if I'm being picky. But honestly, it's great. Like, I'm having a blast driving this thing, and it's just doing everything I'm asking of it on the corners here. It's, by the way, running 245 wide tires all around. This one's got Goodyear Eagle RSA tires, but uh, 245s, and I mean, that's a lot of meat for you know, only 177 horsepower as well. So that certainly helps to, you know, keep the power down. And I mean, I think, you know, reading old reviews, it sounds like this was less tail happy than the competitors were. Uh, but I mean, again, you still have a nice short wheelbase there. You still have, you know, just a, a fun little vehicle. And of course you can play around with tire sizes and all that that if you want but um, you know I think it's just a really good handling little vehicle you have an independent rear suspension in the back it actually has the rear axle from the Cadillac CTS you have a limited slip diff that was standard here in 2009 if you went to earlier model years it was a $200 option on the non GXP solstices to get the limited slip diff um, so I mean 200 bucks you know, not that big of a deal but just want to make sure you have that option checked if you are uh, you know getting one of these and it's not an 09 um, also another funny thing was that ABS
GPS was still an option until 2009 where it was finally standard. Before that, you had to pay extra for anti-lock brakes still, amazingly, which was, kind of, I feel like most stuff by that point in time had it, but I guess they were really trying to go for a lightweight version of this for people who really wanted that, you know, weekend racer kind of vibe. But um, as long as you get all those basic things that you're expecting these days, you know, it's gonna be pretty, uh, you know, stable with the handling and all that. You also had Stability Track, which was their stability control system, traction control system kind of combined here. Um, that was standard in 09, but that was also another thing that was optional uh, in the earlier model years. Coming up to a tight corner here, I'm gonna see if I can get the back end to come out just a little bit. Okay, I got a little bit of chirp out of the back end there, but I think that's really my only thing that I'm noticing is, you know, 245 is just way too wide for this much horsepower. You know, unless you just really want all the grip, and I think that you know Pontiac did brag back at the time this had more lateral grip than its competitors ever so slightly. But you know, a lot of other companies realize that skinnier tires are the way to have more fun, that tail happy kind of character. You know, like we saw with the BRZs that you know debuted a few years later after this 2009, where you know you had 225 or 215 wide tires on those, 200 horsepower, and that was a really fun time. Uh, but you know, with this having less horsepower and wider tires, you know, it just means that it's not quite as playful as I would hope it would be. Again, the GXP version, I'm sure, would solve that and then some, and I'm hoping to maybe someday review one of those. But, you know, this is just a sure-footed grip monster, honestly. I think it'd probably be a great autocross car, but, you know, it's just a really, you know, confidence-inspiring kind of drive, and if you're someone who values that grip, this is gonna be great. If you do want the tail-happy back end, you know, I'd say Miata was a little more tail-happy, and S2000 definitely uh, could be a little snappier at the back end on those compared to this, but, you know, that's really, you know, one of the last things to mention here is, you know, pricing and you know, how it compares the competitors. And uh, like I said, 20 grand to start back in 2006. This one was over $28,000, almost 29,000. And when you convert that with inflation, we're talking a vehicle that in today's 2024 money would cost you uh, roughly about $41,000. You know, but again, that was the same kind of exact pricing basically as Miata. It was matched, you know, very closely to that as far as pricing goes. And then talking about, you know, modern pricing here these days, this one at Ken Ganley, obviously it's gonna be an outlier because it's, you know, so low miles this is probably the lowest mileage solstice to be have been sold you know in a long time and so I mean this one's gonna kind of be in a class of its own as far as pricing goes but uh, you know if you're looking at higher mileage ones I mean especially if you're not worried about you know something with six-figure mileage you can get one of these things for six seven thousand dollars all day long there's a bunch of them listed and that's a lot of fun for that little price tag and even you know a lower mileage one that's you know maybe 50 60 70 thousand miles and even those are like nine grand really reasonable pricing again this one is going to be a lot more just because it is a collectible with how low the miles are and this is like a museum piece of what a solstice was when it was new and uh, so for the right buyer obviously this is going to be an irreplaceable car uh, and that you're going to merit the higher price tag of this one but you know i mean when you're talking about solstices in general and skies as well they also you know same car pretty much uh you know they also are really nice and low with their pricing as well same low prices for a lot of fun and yes this is way slower than an s2000 way less character from the motor than that roaring vtec that you had in the s2000s which i mean hands down the s2000 is obviously a way better car way more fun way more exciting just more more car in all the ways but i mean an s2000 here in 2024 is still going to cost you mid 20,000. so i mean you're talking three to four times as much as one of these you know is it four times more fun i mean it's it is more fun but if you're worried about you know a value proposition here yeah, i think it certainly is going to be the better value especially again considering you, know, you can bump up the power you know with mods you can go for the gxp version if you want you know there's ways to get you know more punch if that's something that you want and um so yeah i mean i really love these little things they're just you know a really fun time i'm having a great you know, this beautiful sunny early spring day you know just having last driving this thing and um yeah i think that these are one of the overlooked vehicles i think that these are going to be future collectibles now i don't have a crystal ball so don't take my word for it but you know these things being even for nice ones you know under ten thousand dollars seems like a steal to me i feel like these are only going to appreciate at some point even though they made a bunch of them you don't see these very often these days so i feel like 
it has the potential to you know really be a sought after collectible down the road and I think it already is in many cases but I mean it's just insane how cheap these things are and I think it's a, a really strong value and you know has a lot of potential the last thing I'll add though is that an NC Miata can be had for this same kind of money and with the Mazda you know you have Japanese build quality of Japanese reliability with that engine and the NC's are great too now I reviewed one a long time ago I honestly wasn't super impressed with the engine it seemed a little bland to me to be totally honest I'd love to revisit that since that was a long time ago since I reviewed that um, I'd like to revisit that now but I mean just from my impression back then it wasn't super exciting uh, but you know those can be had for similar money and uh, you know had a tiny bit less horsepower but very similar performance and uh, you know I'm sure it's still a lot of fun for the money again for something that's well under 10 grand you know these are all just like fantastic fun little vehicles for for the money and uh, you know a really great option here in these ever ballooning uh, prices that we have these days it's great that we have some fun affordable little roadsters that are solid reliable cool looking and still just put a smile on your face as long as you're not worried about winning any kind of drag races but anyway huge thanks once again to Jake from Ken Ganley Toyota for providing me here with this vehicle to review for you guys today definitely uh, check out his info in the uh, description below I ha have his social media stuff and the link to this listing definitely reach out to Jake he'd be more than happy to help you out if this is a vehicle that you're interested in I mean it's like I said one of a kind I've had 4,000 miles on a solstice it's basically the closest you can get to a brand new solstice um, and it's a really you know great experience and a great find so definitely hit up Jake if you'd like to grab this vehicle before someone else does but anyway thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you guys on the next one take care